Hey everyone, this is part two in the ESP32 Automated Irrigation Control System series. If you haven't watched part one, you have to watch part one before watch this video. Click the link up in the top right, we'll take you to it. In the first video, I got that crappy water bill that kicked this whole project off. We did a tour of the yard and its various components, mapped out everything into different diagrams and future diagrams of automation systems, procured various parts and pieces that we might need for the project, Concentrated our efforts specifically on the five wire valve, starting with wiring diagrams, getting this all up and running on the development board, testing out and researching the basic functionality of all the components, writing a custom library that'll support all the functions that we'll need for this valve, successfully running all the use cases that were created in the example program, and pushing the newly created library to Arduino IDE and Platform IO where other folks could download it. Upon completion of part one, all the components were moved from the dev board to the prototype board, as you see here. We'll now move the next phase of the project onto dev board and continue. Let's get started. The water meter is the focus of today's topic. It's just above the auto shutoff valve as shown here. Connectivity is going to be simple. We have our meter. We're going to be tying off one side to ground and the other side we're going to tie off to GPIO 12. The meter transfers the mechanical measurement of flow to digital measurement via a reed switch that's located right here, this white box. There's a magnet that circles the perimeter of this meter, and every now and again, that magnet will pass the reed switch and send a pulse that will allow us to record a certain amount of water flow. So let's take that reed switch off, and we're going to have a look at its function right quick, because we want to understand the functionality of the reed switch because we don't want to run a water main to the lab here we want to find out if we could reduce what we're working with when we develop for this so now we're down to this many components we'll explore the switch with a standard multimeter we can see that it's normally open and using a magnet closes the switch with that information we could actually forego the use of a reed switch during development and we could just use a simple button we could even use a small DC motor with a variable speed to emulate the amount of water that's going through the meter. Our first dev build just replaces the reed switch. Nothing more. Very simple. I want to get into the library. It's at an early stage. I want to talk about some things that go into this. For those who think that, you know, it's just a button at the end of the day, there's really a lot that's going to go into the construction of this as I plan a strategy for how this is going to be implemented. And I start with my get version. I throw this into all my new libraries just so I have something to work with. And I already have two parameters and I'm going to discuss those now. One parameter I already know is that GPIO pin that we talked about earlier. And the other one is the use of internal pull-ups and option for ESP32s as opposed to using uh, a resistor externally. Like if you have an, an Arduino or something like that. And this has been discussed before in previous projects, how something like that is implemented. And basically what I got, and one of the reasons why I'm using this get version, is if we look at the example program that I created, and there really is nothing to this right now, create an instance here called this meter. And in the loop, just keep writing get version over and over every three seconds. It's basically all that's going on in this program in the serial output. But if we look closer, as this instance was created, an interrupt is also created to respond to whenever there is a falling signal right here on that pin. So what I've implemented here, and by the way, I would never implement this in a final program. This is just for test and example. You would never call serial inside an interrupt that could cause all sorts of havoc. But right now, just demonstration, it's okay. But we also see that because it's a mechanical switch, you would never want to implement something for a mechanical switch that didn't have some sort of debounce for filtration because then you would have like 50 presses every time it would press that. So there's some debounce here. I set it for like 300 milliseconds or something just for, for testing. And now we'll go and we'll see what happens. So I'm gonna restart this, which is gonna kick off a three second delay. And it's gonna show some version, which is the return of uh, get version. Every three seconds, continue doing this in a loop. Unless of course we touch the switch closed, it'll cause that interrupt to type the word int aside from that loop. Right, so these are running separate from each other. Still, every three seconds, it's gonna print some version, only unless I touch that switch, no matter how many times I touch that switch. However, if I touch a switch 
more often than 300 milliseconds, it will not register because I have that filter for the debounce. So you see right there, it's going to limit it. But that's just fine. That's what we want. We're going to have to make adjustments uh, with the actual water meter as we learn as we go along. We're now looking at the next iteration of this program. I've added more arguments. And what we have is our GPIO pin, uh, the parameter to use the internal pull-ups. But now we have the measurement of the meter. Is it gallons or liters? Because we need to know that later for calculations. The debounce delay can now be set as we set up this instance, the value on the face of the meter as it comes up, and the increment each time the switch closes, how much is that of that value? Is it a tenth of a gallon or a liter? Is it one gallon or a liter, whatever have you? So now that we have that information, you take a look here. I have a new function, which does a readout and just returns the meter value. But I have an overloaded function, readout if you have a, uh, a character. If it's the same exact character of the meter itself, it's just gonna return whatever it is, just the same as if you didn't have parameter at all, or it's gonna do the conversion for what you want it to do. So if it's liters to gallons or gallons to liters. So I added that little value add early on. And to set and read the debounce delay, I've also added a function. You see set and get. Now, if we look at the response to our interrupt, I removed that print serial, which I mentioned earlier, should never have in there. Inform one of the parameters in this program that there's been an update, which is for future expansion. And now we say take the meter and increment it by our increment value, which we've established already. So that's all it's doing. It's going to be very quick. There's not a whole lot going on. Our main program looks very much the same. I've just provided information as to what the parameters do. But if we look what's going on here in the loop, it's going to print out whatever the value is of the meter at the time. It's going to wait. It's going to print out the value of the meter in liters. And that loop is going to keep running in a circle. I'll point out that just for this demonstration, I put 32.2 gallons as the starting value of the meter. It's just an arbitrary value that I use for testing. This one also has 0.1 gallons is added every time it pulses. It uses 200 milliseconds of uh, delay for the debounce. It's in gallons. And these are the parameters that I've used. Let's try this out, see how it works. We can see that as the program starts, it's showing alternating values of the 32 0.2 gallons that I've added and it's converting it between gallons and liters over and over rotating in the loop now what I'm going to do is just touch those two wires together quickly once and as I do that we can see that it incremented a tenth of a gallon each time I do that and converts to liters I tap it twice and we can see that it recorded those because all that it's really doing is it's incrementing a number in memory and then it's reading off of that number to do these calculations as a separate function. And that's what we were going with. We're at the third iteration now, and there really is a lot going on here in this one. The first thing I wanna point out, and I'll start with, the measurement off the meter has been removed from the parameters. A new parameter has been added in its place, and that is the option to use SPIFFS to autosave the meter value to the file system so what we have is in looking at setup, we have our setup, I added a little banner, and now we have as a parameter, the setting of the meter. It's no longer when we construct the instance of this object. So we've just put it right here. Just below this is another function that initializes a file system. This of course only works if spiffs was set to true up here. Now, when this is set to true, I had mentioned earlier about an update flag that goes to true whenever the meter changes. This function down here, check update, looked for that update to make the right calls to the file system. Now, because of the way this is set up in loop and the delays, obviously this is just for demonstration purposes. You could have a process on a, on a second processor that checks appropriately when to check for updates. Let's take a look behind the scenes, uh, particularly at the initialization of the file system. So when the file system is initialized, it does check to see there is a, uh, a parameter to uh, format SPIFFS on the system if it isn't formatted instead of failing. If it still doesn't work, it, it will return an error that something went wrong. It'll check to see if the file exists or not. If it doesn't exist, it'll go to the write file process that'll actually write the file out based on the previously executed command that writes the value to memory. So it'll grab that value from memory, it'll write it to the file and close out, and now you have that value stored and you'll just build from there. If it does find the file, already in memory on initialization or power on or whatnot, it'll read that file into memory. And there you go. Now it's in memory, you continue onward. 
or if it finds that you didn't enable SPIFFS, it'll just exit out of here without doing anything and say you didn't enable SPIFFS support. Write file will just take this file and open it up for writing. There is a uh, process that I do, which will uh, convert the value, that double value into characters. So it could write the characters to the file, and then it will save it, and then it'll close the file. That's it, writing's done. In the reading portion, reading reads in a character at a time into a character array. And I've added something in here as well, because if it should become corrupted, it's sort of rudimentary, I know that if it's more than 15 characters already, it could be like 8,000 read forever, the device crashes and there's no way to get rid of it. And at this point already, it says, okay, it's 15 characters, it's corrupted, just delete it and, and make a new one. So that, that saves all sorts of problems should something go wrong. But assuming that everything's fine, it'll read in those characters. And remember, it, they are in fact characters. So those characters are converted back to a double. And then that double is sent back to that value meter. So now that meter's in memory. And at that point, everything's initialized one way or another. That file's going to be written or read or what have you from that initialization. With regard to check update, I mentioned earlier there's an update flag every time the interrupt goes off. So here's our interrupt, and we can see that in the course of our interrupt, update goes high. Whenever check update is run, it checks to see if update is high. If, if it's not high, no update, it just leaves. But if it is high, it runs that write file function. If we look at write file again, we see that function, that meter file opens up, that double meter value is converted back to a character array, and that it is written to the file, and then the file is closed. If you ever lose power, you ever reboot, it'll always read from the last time, so the meter is always updated with the file. Let's see how this works. I start with a newly created 32.2 gallon file, which we can see it finds and loads into memory, polling for an update we're going to touch those two wires together and we can see that when I do it finds an update and it writes 32.3 and every time I touch those wires together it again writes an update it's not writing an update whenever I touch the wires together it's writing an update every time it sees that the update flag is high and it's pulling from memory whatever that value is at the moment so in multiple instances I touch it it does it but now I'm going to pull the power out we see power is removed and I'm going to plug power back in and we're going to regain uh, our access uh, to the serial console so we can look at what's going on. And wait for the serial to come up. And when it comes up, we see that we're right back at the same value we were before because it is reading from SPIFFS to get the value. Even though power was lost, we're not losing where we were. It's stored on here. So now I begin the fabrication of a simple electrical unit that will emulate the water meter by using a wheel and a motor with a magnet to activate the read switch at regular intervals controlled by a potentiometer. And here it's working and I've got it hooked up to a very small battery and an oscilloscope so we could watch the output signal on the oscilloscope and we could see it's a, like a duty cycle because we've got the voltage opening and closing in such a manner. The scope is set to a falling slope is how it's triggering, very much like it would be picked up on the ESP32. From the observation of the oscilloscope, this appears to be very clean. Uh, we don't know how the ESP32 is going to react to it, but we're going to be able to set that value that allows for the debounce delay to be changed, and this might be an entirely different value from ultimately what we're going to find on the actual meter when we install it. Just like with the last library created for this project, I have already added it to the Arduino libraries so that we could go down to manage libraries. Once this loads, we should be able to find it by typing in water meter. There it is. I haven't even installed it in Arduino yet. So I'll install it now. Version 1.0 at the time of this video. We'll close this out. Now we'll open the example program. We'll go to File, Examples, and way down, we can see Water Meter, and then Test Meter. We see our example program exactly as it was during development, and we're not going to do anything to it. We're simply going to push it to the device. So we have the test program running in Arduino IDE. 
no problem at all. All the stuff written in Platform.io, running in Arduino IDE with no modifications. It starting at 32.4 because I accidentally bumped the magnet a couple times. Also, that 9-volt battery is just there for stability. It doesn't do anything in the circuit. I'm just going to roll it with my fingers a couple times past that read switch just to see that manually it increments as we do so. You see 32.5. Thirty-two point six. Obviously, if it spins multiple times between intervals, it'll write whatever it collected between those intervals, like so. Now we'll hook up this motor. Potentiometer is not ideal for this, but I could get the motor to spin uh, enough to demonstrate when I hook it up to the prototype board. I'll use a more appropriate potentiometer, but for right now, it serves a purpose, and we could see it incrementing. Uh, each second, we're seeing, you know, gallons or more at this speed. And it might not be uh, the right speed that we would want ideally for testing. I stop it right now right quick just to see. Okay, update stopped. And that's fine. Not ideal like I said, but it is ideal to simulate water flow without, again, running a water line into the prototype board. It's going to serve the purpose for development, and that's what we're going with. On the actual meter, we'll be able to set the debounce delay properly by reading the output of the physical meter against this output and making sure that everything is accurate. These components will now move over to the prototype board, and with that, we're done with Chapter 2. In Chapter 3, we're going to start putting all these things that we've been putting together the first two chapters into something that we can use to define what our sprinkler system will be. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hey, do me a favor. Hit that like button down below. Helps me out a lot when you do. Also, hit that subscribe button for more videos. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Would you like to reply?